Are you guys ready? Okay. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm really glad today to introduce you to Stole. I will try to pronounce his whole name fully because I make it wrong every single time. But, um, well, Stole is a professor at Albert University in Art and Technology. And the reason why Tony and Andreas and myself wanted him to come is because he will introduce you to his work method, which is very unconventional in this, let's say, the terms that you might be used to uh, see at our design school here. And um, I don't want to talk a lot because I want to start to really introduce himself. I'll just let you know how we got to know him. And uh, at some point, I was invited to teach a workshop in Oslo, and my agenda was fully packed, so I asked Tony. If you could take over, he would go to Oslo to teach his workshop. So Tony went there, and during the day he was teaching the workshop, and Stolle was guiding him through the crazy nights of Oslo, I guess. And when he came back, he was like, yeah, I met this really tall man, and he wants to make a project. At that point, we didn't know that Stolle was on his way to a PhD, and on his academic career to become a professor. <laughs> so it's like, this tall guy, he wants to make something with motors attached to the body. And uh, he would come over, and he showed up at our office one day wearing a red cape, like, you know, like from here to there, well, like too long, two meters long red cape. So uh, that said, I think Stolle will tell us more about it. So uh, there will be a lot of room for questions in the end. We have a lot of time today. I will ask you to please, you know, uh, keep your questions because it will be really interesting to have a debate in the end, you know, about the projects or the method or what you think is interesting for your own personal development as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Open the floor for Stolle. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Medea. Thank you, Barbara, for inviting me. I'm um, happy to be here. Can you all hear me fine with this? That is strange noise in my, my own head there. That sounds like the voice is in my head. Um, I would say not might be. Um, yeah, a little about the writing hood. That was kind of the first start for the whole cooperation. Uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about me, uh, actually my favorite topic, topic myself. Um, as David says, my name is Stolle. It's actually an old Swedish name. Um, uh, but I always call myself Stahl, because I spent many years in Germany, where I uh, also studied art. Um, and that's my background. In the classical arts, I come from uh, First philosophy, and then I started to do classical crafts. Or kind of go away, but I started to do, started out in the painting section, the drawing section, and the sculpture section. So I've done my bronze sculptures, quite a, quite a few of them actually, figurative. Uh, and I came into at an early age into the computing world um, through my teacher at school, but in child school back in. Actually, you won't even believe that, maybe it was 79, uh, the first computing class. But I didn't start using it before in the 90s. But my way to have talk to you today is, is inspired by this. Um, my way into the digital domain. Uh, you might have seen this one. Has anyone, anyone been to Rome? Have you seen it? No? It's not live? Uh, uh, it's, it's one of the most beautiful sculptures on this planet, you know, uh, the uh, Ecstasy of Teresa by Bernini. Uh, for me, this image, you know, sort of signifies my background in this sort of, that art, that sort of uh, Pygmalion and Galatea myth of how, how it, what you dream of when you, when you do, uh, deal with classical arts is to you know, shape your image shape your sculpture in such a manner that it comes alive, it literally comes alive and walks away or stays together with you. Um, and to what effect? In 1817, the French writer Stendhal went to, to Florence and he, I mean, you know, 
Florence, Florence, sorry, the Rome, Florence, yeah, the Rome, which is collection. And I went to so see the arts of, of Florence in uh, 1817. And he was uh, so taken by the art, he became some kind of Teresa like figure. He reported uh, dizziness, uh, he reported heart, uh, his heart uh, beating hectically. He reported uh, feeling totally out of his body. Um, basically, he, he turned sick out of this overly strong aesthetical experience. And this report of his, 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 um, his uh, art attack, how art attacked him, as later became uh, known as the Stendhal syndrome. Uh, and uh, some people experience this syndrome of being overwhelmed by, by art and experiences. Um, and that's kind of one of my, you know, background I come from, you know, the, the, the uh, romantic background where actually art is about what monks are, their lifeblood, painting with your lifeblood, pretty dramatic. But that state of mind that St. Teresa had, that state of mind that a Stendhal experienced, those sensations, that's um, one of my inspirations. If not to recreate the ecstasy, at least to create that kind of space where I myself uh, somehow, uh, through arts, see the world and experience the world in a different manner. So how do I work? This is basically a synopsis of my thesis, uh, a verbal uh, synopsis. And as you see, Haptic research, touch experience, body, that's kind of the way I still use. So in a way I'm still sculpting, sculpting my, 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 uh, my art and uh, the media, my approach to media through the body. Um, and that's also sort of my one foot in the phenomenological tradition. We are not just brain, mind and body, we are some kind of uh, nervous or network of, of complexities um, founded in the body itself, in the world. We're set in the world and we're set in the body. So, this is my master's degree, master's uh, 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 project that I worked on for quite some time, uh, 1993, Cyrus. Uh, that's the first first step into bodily communication through the uh, internet, um, 20 years ago now. Um, for me that became a you know, defining moment. Um, that started out as a quite a, actually an ironic project, because uh, back in, back in, I um, talked about that uh, before, um, back in 93, you had first virtual reality systems. Uh, you didn't have internet. You had the internet, but you didn't have the World Wide Web. So, uh, three I was already uh, on the on the pre web, you can say. The, the, uh, um, I had my main address, I was uh, computer five, but it was still this crazy world, and virtual reality came in 89, and that NASA, the visual, uh, I forget the language, the strange guy, Jerome Lanier, this. Really fat, dreadlock American that talked about all the beautiful things you could do in the internet. And then you had American writers talking about, yeah, we could even have sex in the future. A little bit so much better than, than that sex in reality. You're right. So uh, we, we had this cultural frenzy. The, you know, the, the possibilities were endless. And uh, well, I use it. Uh, strange renderings and strange environments, uh, immersive environments. Um, but then I thought, oh, let's, let's check this out. Yeah, let's see how far you can take this experience. Uh, how far you can actually push the bodily limits or experiences. So I, uh, I devised this uh, drug-inspired experiment. We can have a complete bodily control through these bodysuits uh, that would have different kind of mechanical uh, 
possibilities. Um, and it was main, actually meant to sort of see, you know, going to a, a romantic tradition, how, how ridiculous technology is compared to the beauty of human technology. You know, the sensation level, you know, between your two fingers here is extremely high, but you can sense, touch, and an experience. So I built the system, and as I, as I built the system together with an American called Troy Walford, um, we, we just discovered, wow, this is functional. And this is not just replacing the body, actually it's not replacing the body, it adds something to the body. So uh, in the end, uh, in 1993, we had a view of this between Paris and Cologne. And what we experienced is that two participants set apart by distance, wearing rubber suits uh, with different kind of mechanical shakers on the nipples, uh, dildos, um, anal stuff, uh, shockers on the legs, pretty rough, rough, painful stuff. When they were connecting over the internet, they started to, to talk, to chat, to, to laugh, to do quite different things than we expected. It became something no one had imagined before or tried before. It became a bodily extension, um, and adding to, to um, you know, normal reality. And it was extremely immersive. Uh, one story, uh, Sort of suppressed it, but one guy, one guy in Cologne, he, he tried it out. He was totally like fascinated by it. So what he does, he runs home to his girlfriend and tells, you know what I did today? I actually touched someone in Paris. And the touch is like, you know, yeah, that's vibrator shaking, pretty you know, on-off thing, pretty, you know, pretty mechanical. It's not like you would stroke her or I don't know, carry her the air or something. Pretty basic. But they talked. And that's a kind of bodily contact. So he came home to her, and uh, well, he told me that I met next time. Really happy. And she just listened to him, and sort of slaps him, and spits up. So that's the real time consequences. Um, this, again, you know, added to the, the depth of this. I'm not sure you know Giger's. Um, uh, Alien fantasies. The funniness of the actual experience of the first step of this first sort of steam engine of, of uh, teletype telecommunications. So they connect the bodies over the net. Um, by the way, they communicate also a visual interface with three dimensional uh, bodies, but uh, for me, the haptic dimension is very important. But that's symbiosis. Well, you know, it's, the question is, you know, at what point does technology not just add to our life, but also invade our lives? That's, of course, also the back up here, the, uh, the critical kind of analysis. Um, but and that's also been sort of my sort of uneasiness about these technologies. How do we actually, what do we achieve and what do we lose? How do we exploit it? And how are we getting exploited in that sense? So yeah, I think you know, in terms of discursive design, just to give you that backdrop, you know, I think design, well, that's the advantage of dealing with arts and technology, is you know, just to ask questions. Like, you know, what happens if you do this? And use arts as a domain to try out the, the, the worst or even best fantasies. This is my next project after, after, after uh, cyber um, where I, you know, at that, that time we had this rubber things, screen-based stuff, we had three-dimensional uh, bodies, three-rendered navigable, navigable movies of uh, scanned bodies. It was very much like you st stood here and you would have a uh, look at your partner through the screen and uh, communicate through this screen-based interaction. But I wanted to have a body-based interaction. So I built the first intelligent bodysuit. Um, same, same system, uh, uh, but this time you have eight songs in the body, eight parts. Uh, legs, groin, ass, you know, tits, arms, uh, basic um, places of, of communication. It's actually the, the only image uh, left of this uh, project, the only 
digital image. It's from the dig digital camera, quite high resolution in 1994. Uh, um, so I built in pressure zones, pressure pads in this, uh, this body, in a very thin uh, pad. So it would give it like a nice, nicely, you know, fit, snug um, suit kind of feeling. So when you would touch your, your, your arm here, you would feel it on your body. If I touch my leg, it would go to your leg. So we tried out this sort of one to one transition before we went into, into a mode where you could press two patterns and send strange patterns across um, to make people play in their body. And what happened to me then was that, you know, this sort of one to one intelligence clothing, um, kind of cool tech project, you know, it's not just a keyboard or a screen, it's also the body that becomes, as I call it, um, um, it's not only the interface between you and me, it's the interskin. That's why uh, the title is Interskin. Uh, play on the screen, best thing. What happened is that at that time, these participants, I didn't expect that either. That's how they looked. They, they didn't, you know, go like this or press, they, they became like, they became, you know, the gaze kind of crossed eye, crossed eye, and then started to touch themselves. Um, here the resolution is really quite, quite, quite small, but they, the way they, this guy, this German brutal, this guy, was quite a tough guy, you know, he starts to just stroke himself in a manner that, where, you know, the gaze goes inward. That became for me one of the, you know, the, the uh, sort of, also a defining moment to see how people change their perception. Change the um, In a way, I mean, I'm sure he's this guy, he would not stand there. I won't do this. But this way, in this way of technology gives you um, an added strange point of view. Here's a version I built later of this. Uh, this is the 120 songs version. Um, that I built uh, for a show actually in, in Croatia um, as another spectacular failed experiment. Uh, it had a much higher resolution, much higher uh, degree of, of sensation, but the suit was, uh, I was actually visually not satisfied with the suit. How there's the square parts which are actually the pressure zones how the suit was, uh, was functioning. The participants uh, enjoyed it. Uh, 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 so you actually see two participants, each with 120 outputs uh, as Barbados. Uh, you can try them later on. Uh, and uh, 120 inputs, pressure cuts. What it looks like. That's, uh, it's actually quite a high resolution to have on the body. But if you see, look at the, you know, how that should play, it's quite coarse. And that again, you know, is, is kind of underlying, you know, the difference between, you know, the, the uh, approximate three to five thousand uh, nerve-based sensors for, for square millimeter skin on their hands. You can't really compare to that. Uh, it's just a resolution. But it doesn't matter because the output gives something. It, um, it, um, it's not a skin replacement, it's an adding to person. So, um, after the skin, I went into the, the culture domain to, to you know, or a few of my experiments with these other sort of dystopic um, um, alien, vegan like thing. And we asked the question of what happens if we really turn into a if the machine turns into our world. This is much of a 90s question. That was, that was before social media. Um, and so that Coagula means you know, um, it's, it's turned from the alch alchemical approach to what? Uh, you have to dissolve something and then 
um, quadrant ducted uh, in U4 in order to make gold. So uh, and we tried to, you know, to see, to actually research what happens um, through arts if you come in a kind of creature, what happens to you. Uh, I won't show you the video. Um, but, uh, the gold was this strange installation where you basically also stuck inside this bodysuit that through the voice channel you talk to a, a, a uh, intelligent creature you build uh, as far as you can build intelligent uh, computer you build, build a sensing machine looking for patterns frequencies pitches uh, in your voice to understand what you felt and accordingly it would, it would stimulate the body quite violently to, to, uh, to move, scream, or, um, and so on. And what you saw, this is also quite funny, uh, in terms of media history, uh, you would wear goggles, right? Now it would be 96. Um, you would wear goggles, 96, 97. And that was high tech, you know? The, uh, you know, you got Google goggles soon. But uh, the goggles industry was really on its height back in 95, 96. But yeah, it, everybody wanted to have 3D glasses. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, it disappeared. And most likely, the Google Glass will be really fancy for the first uh, two years, and then they also disappear again. Just like 3D. Mm. 3D TVs are now on their way out again. Um, these things are, you know, that's one way of the advantage in, in having around the technology for some time to see what, what kind of brings you about and you know, what becomes the sort of cultural developments um, partially carried by industry. But you, inside this thing, in the glass, you see these creatures that move around and they touch you. And they're not pleasant as uh, such, but they're, 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 they're um, touching you. So we use aesthetics to create this strange life world to see what happens if we became a part of this dystopian machine. We showed this project on um, uh, several locations, as well like Ars Electronica. Um, has anyone been to Ars Electronica? Here? You've been, of course. No one else? That's the place you really should go uh, if you deal with um, uh, media, design, and uh, interactions. It's the place, you know, it's like the Oscars of the media, media design, media art world. In the first week of September every year, you will always see new attempts, new experiments uh, at that place. Small uh, Austrian village um, or city that uh, has really uh, made the impossible leap into becoming the center of, of, of uh, yeah, experimental media. We also have the um, first museum of the future, and that's really worthwhile. Whatever they do at MIT, uh, uh, they will show the lids before, beforehand. So this, this machine experiment, you know, led me to this other sort of frenzy uh, back in '99. You know, '99, um, we had two phenomena. Uh, we had, you know, the, the turn of the millennium, right, ahead of us. Um, this is also something, something we forget. Uh, who recalls the uh, 2YK book? Yeah. Who earned money on, uh, on, on the 2YK book? Did you? No. That was, I mean, that was crazy. I mean, how, how people, oh no, all computers are going to break down. Recall that. A company paid lots of money to try to To avoid it. Yeah. All because we think the internal computer clocks, we thought they're not adapted to, to, to understand the event of change, so they will fuck up the whole world in 99, you know. Um, you barely had the internet in 99, you know, um, compared to now. There's certainly no social media uh, as, as Facebook or that frenzy. So that, that was that was pretty, pretty crazy days, but of course, not just in, 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 in uh, technological terms, but in terms of, of belief. Every turn of centuries or millennia signify 
you know, a leap in society, a leap in it forwards or perhaps backwards. What are you guys doing on the 21st of September, uh, December this year? You know what happened then? You know? Exactly. The world will disappear. You have plans? You have plans? <laughs> Get <laughs> what, what are you going to do? I have no plans. <laughs> you have no plans? Okay. Well, a, a friend of mine, uh, she has just met her lovely boy, and uh, he's totally convinced that the world is going up. So they are there, literally planning. Uh, I think she sees that as a love vacation, but he is determined to, uh, to escape the world on the 21st. What is mine and mine? Um, you know, what happens? Um, and, uh, you know, the resurrection of Christ is also one of the, 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 uh, the ideas we had you know, 2,000 years after, if he was born 2,000 years ago, um, he would come back somehow. That is sort of, a sort of thinking, you know, or something will happen. You know, something big will happen in 2,000. Not just the stupid white bottles with 2,000 written on. Um, Anyway, so in this, in this setting, I, I planned a uh, much more elaborate work in the beginning. But I, I, I built this framework, and I was like, well, what if something big will happen? What if I can become my own god? What if technology can make me into my own god? What if I could write my own Bible? What if my body becomes what it really is, my, my, my sort of universe? Um, so I built this elliptical uh, project where it's literally a, a you know, classical ritualistic machine. Um, on this library construction, you woke up, and then come to the top, you kneel down, and you put the suit on. Um, so you're actually positioned you know, in this thing here, and that you physically, you know, you're not moving around, you're physically stuck in installation. And you put this um, priest clothes on, and there you are. And if you ever try to stand like this, you feel, you feel small. You feel small compared to technology. And when you kneel down, you have this space of 16 loudspeakers around you. So you're actually inside, immersed, um, in a physical sound space. Not just a simulated sound space, but it's actual sound waves coming from all around you. Um, so together with uh, uh, a guy called Von Gustus and Oscar and Fleur, Max MSP guys, we built this uh, real-time composition system that, um, based on grammar synthesis, and the sounds, three-second sound samples from a uh, actually, uh, an, an intercourse sequence where we wired two people with microphones, several microphones, and recorded their body sounds. We took three seconds of like this, but it's like maybe like a, a tenth of a second of a gaze, uh, like a gasp, and made this breathing space that you would trigger once you touch your body inside this bodysuit. Here's some of the priestess clothes that you've got off your body. And then wrap your legs here. Uh, the rod would, would stimulate your, your groin. And the uh, stomach, you have the uh, middle part going all the way around. Plus up here on the shoulder pieces. Here's the inside of it. Um, it also uses 120 uh, cells. It was attached. This was the attachment. You couldn't see the cable belt. It was attached to the uh, thing you were kneeling over. And so here's the inside. So here you know, is an example of bodysuit design, where you know, it's not just functionality. It's really about the world, the design, how you enter an installation, when you enter a space, you see something. Uh, the very detail in terms of you know, inside, outside, elegance, priestly suit, uh, very ritualistic. Um, here you might see these sort of square shapes here. Each square is, again, uh, an input and output. Pressure sensor and, and, um, and barbarian. I custom built uh, uh, my own 
use for this one. In other words, you know, hardcore interface. But you output enough power. Um, and then we have this thing, and you reveal that. And what you could see, and this is where the Bible comes in, you know, in, in, the, in the beginning, um, you know, there was the word. And everything you saw inside this tree, inside cave, was built on words. Words taken up from, from a library. When you, when you would touch yourself, you would tell the machine, or you would talk to the machine, it would sense you as you touch yourself auto or degree. And it would try to see your patterns and create sentences based on, on the excerpts and words uh, from the Quran, the Testament, uh, all that, uh, you just image. Um, and create these sort of strange, hallucinogenic uh, sentences that you couldn't read, but you could see them flash around you. Uh, very beautiful patterns, uh, word-based uh, pixels. Um, so you actually touch yourself and sense the Bible as it would touch you back. Bible, the story of creation, um, how you come alive, how you come into being. So it was some kind of you know, embodied kind of writing machine, typing machine. What happened here is you know, people, uh, they were always performed in, the, in, in public settings. Um, you know, three larger shows with this one. I mean, if you come to the size of machinery, you'd be actually very thankful not to show it, because it's just like a lot of work to do. Uh, we showed it, for instance, the Kenyon Star Center in Norway, and also the, the Death Festival in Rotterdam, the Dutch Electronic Art Festival. So people will, when you know, they will start touching themselves, and you know, an auto-erotic experience, you know. Again, back also in, in interskin and all these things. It's here, this sort of, you know, you start to do things, and people, although they're inside the installation, you can see them through from backside and through uh, slides on the side. The people, these bidders, they get themselves. And it's quite interesting how they immerse themselves into this. There's another from my another version from behind. Of people observe but yet they but you know that's, as, a, as an artist and designer it's, it's really yeah it's really enjoyable to see that people actually disappear inside your world. They, they sit apart. And you know they get into it in a way. This is also a guy that took shots out of you know, some spy shots from behind how they you know, react to things. Um, uh, these images are uh, used for my PhD uh, because I, I wrote my PhD, the first slide is on the, the word slides, uh, on this how do you how do you experience touch? How can touch be used as a material to create uh, yeah, experience, experiences um, and works of art. So here you get a impression of the, the, the graphics on all three sides of the wall. That was Air of the God. So here's how David saw them the first time. In his office. Tall, dead, radical. This is now going upward towards contemporary times. Um, it's actually, what's the first one, the second, first, the first bit, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to now continue into um, the later developments of these historical uh, uh, things. These installations belong, in a way, in terms of culture history. To the 1990s and the 2000s, you know, they belong to installation pieces. They belong to breakthroughs in technologies, breakthroughs using haptic technologies, breakthroughs in terms of immersive installations, uh, learning a new world. Um, and that's why I'm also a dinosaur because you know, in the 90s where I grew up, you know, we're into technologies, we're into media art. Um, it was much, much about breaking. You know, breaking the wall. What is possible? 
not not uh, how to use it or what content was about breaking the wall technologically. It still is, you know, and you want to break sort of the speed limits now with your brand new technology. Uh, that's of course also a part of what we're doing here, but it's, it's again also interesting how you, the content can be used and evolved. And the blind theater was for me much such a program, uh, such an attempt. Uh, two ways, thanks to you guys, we were able to build a variable system. I'll come back to this slide. Um, what you see here is what um, Tony built called the Dusk. It's a 6 to 4, or the Unibase 6 to 4 P and W outputs. So outputs you can control. Um, all contained in a small box. Uh, run by uh, well, hard to see, uh, yeah, a 1.2 kilo little laptop. Put uh, on the back of the participants. That's how it's placed in the back. It's quite bulky, but it's much, much less than, uh, than, uh, than my previous systems, which are uh, yeah, like a piece of size. Uh, <coughs> so for the first time, we were able to build a complex bodysuit, mobile wearable bodysuit with six to four you know, adaptable dynamic outputs. That was quite a, quite a leap. But the important thing here was how we used that. Uh, we built the bodysuit. Uh, and again, once you get into the body, um, as Tony has been doing a lot uh, as well, you want to, oh, what you see here on this in the beaver, you would work with, in this case, a small blonde woman, beautiful woman. She looks really nice, except, you know, compared to my size, she's like petite. Um, you will be amazed if you would compare, for instance, the, uh, if you have the same height, male and female, it would more or less the same. The difference in, you know, in, in, in the massivity of men compared to this. So when you build bodysuits, you want to have, you can't build like, you know, 10 suits because it's way too costly and, and uh, time consuming. You want to build one size fits all, like bodysuits, one size fits all. It's really impossible. But uh, um, there's ways of doing it. And in this case, we built an elaborate system. We have a corset. I built actually three corsets, uh, large, medium, and small. Because the better your depth, the better the, the heel. Um, and for the legs, maybe it's a bit here. We built this uh, system where you have, have long, like three meter long, long um, belts. You would tie around the body to get a really snug uh, sensation. On top of that, you would put uh, a skate. Okay. my voice. It's in my head. Um, it's really quite interesting. It's, 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 to stand here, it's really like it's, it's uh, someone is talking inside you and to at the same time. Um, so you, the red cape that uh, David talked about is, uh, is uh, very kind of British, it's little cane, cape again, you know, symbolic. But you have over your head and uh, over your body. And its purpose are several. I will the first slide here. This is a participant. She has no idea I'm looking at her. It's a blind theater. What we did, was that we got the National Theater in Oslo, this beautiful uh, uh, classical building right downtown. We got it at midnight. The whole week. So what we wanted to do, conceptually and practically, was to blind four people, play on, on the on the image of the dark theater, the dark and dead theater, to make the spirit of the theater come alive. Uh, and to do that, we wanted everything to be dark, 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 dark. Um, so not only did we did we end allowed to enter the National Theatre at midnight, not before. So we enter the theatre in complete darkness. You would be, would be dressed by uh, a, uh, a guide in the suit, personally. It's very exclusive in that sense, not really a sort of you know, public display piece. 
Um, and you would get in the end goggles on, special goggles on, with a blindfold and a cape on. You would actually literally walk around totally in sort of sensory deprivation. With headphones that will give you binaural sounds <laughs> and, and, and uh, haptic stimulation as you discover the theater walking around. Live theater. Um, now, I said about you know, what do you do uh, with technologies? In this case, we use binaural sound recordings uh, in combination with haptic patterns to recreate massive of you know, the existence, non existent spirits of the, of the theater. Uh, we had uh, five writers writing five different stories about how it was to become a woman. So, what you sensed in this suit here, the six foot four of the suit covering the body, was actually a very elaborate, intimate story of a woman telling you about some defining moment of her life into your ear, as, as the sound would literally move in your head. Um, and that's things, you know, these body suits can't give alone. You have to have that content that contextualizes, not just in the theater, but in your body through the, you know, the, the words and uh, intentions. This is actually before we started to work together. Slide this. This is the, the, the first slide, first conceptual slide of my World Ripple project. This was actually how we met um, the first time um, through this one. Um, the back here was the first preparation, but this is, a, you know, my attempt my wish was back in 2004 to build, build this variable system. So you can actually walk around, and here you sort of the conceptual thing, like this image. You walk around, and suddenly you would feel something. Here. I mean, it's here. I mean, the trigger. It's here. And what's there? You know, what if you could actually sense invisible sculptures placed in sound, beneath the ecstasy right here? You could listen to them, you could touch them. That was the part of you know, the, my idea, how to tag the world with experiences, tag it with sensations. Um, I mean, not just sculpture, it could be like your homepage, it could be you know, your Facebook page or your Twitter message. And now, as we'll soon see, that's, that's very doable, but back in, in 90, uh, 2000, 2004, they didn't have smartphones yet. And it's actually quite a big paradigm shift. Here you had 3.5 kilo heavy computers as the most mobile thing you, you could use. So here's basically the, the setup to do that. Um, <coughs> a quite ordinary piece of clothing where you would uh, uh, have the first uh, outfit to be Protectors built into your jacket. Then you have the, the, the audio, uh, GPS, of course, GPS control thing. Has anyone worked with GPS on PC? Yeah. I don't know if tried to buy any so on GPS sensor. Have you? Yeah, it's, 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 it sucks. Uh, it's possible, but it really, it's really a hard work. So we spend lots of time with, with uh, in precision, learning about all the impracticalities of real life GPS usage through this project. But it was uh, quite, quite, uh, quite fun. Here's an image of how we foresaw it and also placed the first experiments on Jungsteuge. And that's all I saw where Andreas uh, just pulled up that very, very, almost shot the year ago. Uh, I have an atelier here, the Wolfs uh, in Oslo. They were, they, you know, they, 100 meters up here, that's where they. Was exploding. So, uh, my athlete is just down the street here. So, the bombings were very close to us. But I used this square, uh, this so called red square of Norway, because the Labour Party here, uh, as my kind of test site for years with these experiments. Uh, so, the idea is you walk around and you, you as you walk, uh, this photo image, you, you pass this invisible red zone, and there, the trigger stop. It triggered basically a virtual beta. And as we know, there can be anything. And that's, you know, again, here's inspiration as 
what happens when the world becomes five digits. It's not just chatting as you go on, but what happens when if you reposition the whole digital desktop into the world. What can it sense? Um, back to Bonini, you know, this is what I, I want to have. I, I want to have, I want to sense something I, I haven't sensed before. I want to, here is, uh, again, a spy shot of uh, one test user that walks along and suddenly she starts to feel something. Um, she just laughs, you know, she's like, it's just like, what's happening? Here is Mark Patterson. Uh, he's the author of the senseless, senseless of touch. Very good book on all haptics. Uh, also, chest trying the suit. Here with a finger glove, a haptic finger glove. You can't actually um, sense um, the position of this, but it's an interesting uh, device to, to stimulate it uh, as if you would touch something. But here, where's a, a test suit below that? Um, and that's, you know, for me as a media artist, this is what I, I, I like to achieve, is a media kind of strange um, experience of something that, that, that makes you, well, what was, what, what did you actually, hey, come on, you know, some kind of surprise. Um, and to test that, um, I wanted to not just check out these things in, in Norway, but also to see how happens in different cultural contexts. So one of my issues, I'm not sure what side about this, uh, we can talk about it more some other time. I went to Iran, to Tehran in 2008, to, uh, to see what happened, what happens with Iranian women. Because the irony of you know, with cyber sex is that to have cyber sex, you have to dress. And in Iran, I thought, what happens with these women? Now, they are so dressed, they sort of turning off all the sexuality, we think, you know, asexual with all their clothing. What if I could dress them naked? Um, and to give them a, a sensation of being touched, uh, uh, or sensing touch uh, as if they had no clothes on, out in the open, to give them a body back. That was, you know, my idea. Um, being in Iran, you definitely experience uh, different, uh, much different things. Uh, some things are worse, some things are much better than, than uh, what you're sort of uh, preconceived, uh, preconceived uh, dogmas about uh, Muslim countries. But it, it's definitely quite dangerous, risky, I would say, for me to work with women in Iran, because the contact between sexes are really, you, know, you don't have it. But uh, with a very honest and uh, honorable uh, Mary Bowman, we had, uh, and some others too, we were able to uh, do, do this test with a, with a touch. Uh, so I built this virtual this local suit filled with, uh, again, six foot board. No, sorry, that was definitely something about Barbados. But it did built as, as um, quite beautiful man, as tools, sort of hanging tools um, inside the suit. Uh, we would devise sculptures in downtown Tehran and uh, experiment with these women walking with their computers in the bag. Uh, the only thing showing off, which was quite, quite obvious to us at least, was uh, here, here at the back. You could see the um, cable sticking up. We had to use the, these laptop computers. Uh, interesting experience, uh, also in terms of symbol, symbol, symbolism. How to use clothing, how it's to be used in different cultures. Now, touch is conceived. But now, that was the first thing I built, and then uh, we met, and uh, first we had the uh, theater, and then we built this one. Uh, we had uh, uh, together with uh, uh, David and uh, somebody else. Um, which really uh, is, in technological terms, quite a breakthrough. But for the first time, you really have an 80 uh, pulse uh, mobility output uh, system based on the um, starboard uh, OS 
folder. Uh, again, our user base to the uh, so much you can say about the specifics. Uh, a very lightweight, small board uh, run by, you know, uh, well, still a pretty large battery pack. And in the back here, you have your um, uh, smartphone. And we have Bluetooth controls this uh, board. So only have your phone and your phone around. Listening to what you can see here in this display, here you see green spots, and they're actually the spots, is those red spots from the last picture. Uh, the zones tagged with these invisible sculptures. So that's what that happened in Ljubljana for the first time today. They walk around uh, and sensing, listening to stories and, and uh, strange experiences. And I call, it, I call that psychoplastics. What happened is that as a user, you, you, you're actually able in this mobile setting to, to influence people's perception. I wouldn't say precisely, but you can tell people stories. You can recreate uh, events that, uh, that um, do something to your overall perception. And that's one of the, uh, you know, the conditions I'm looking for. How can you tell stories? And how can you experience the world in, in, in a new manner as if even your mental dimension is perfectly plastic. Here is from the Opera and Oslo. Um, um, the next, uh, at the same time, maybe I have tests there. So here's a, a Google view, a Google Maps view. And here it shows how you sort of place these songs. Uh, to Google Maps, uh, uh, here, but on the other road, just double click, type songs, you add qualities. In this case, sound and, and, and patterns. Uh, we can really literally, you know, carpet bomb the whole area. Uh, and also did user tests here to see what happens. Uh, when it wasn't an artistic uh, uh, event. It was more in my, my own sort of private user tests in, the, uh, in our uh, design process. So here's uh, what a user would look like. Um, yeah. Um, I let them walk around, you know, as long as they wanted to, usually, I think they were, half an hour. And then I would walk around with them, without them, and take shots as they went along. And, and these are actually two shots from this process, which is uh, I kind of like. I mean, the guy looks different, but basically, uh, I mean, you don't know, usually wear this band with it, but uh, it looks kind of normal. And she definitely looks quite normal. Um, even though you know, her leg, leg man has fallen down a bit. She walked around and she, she walked like this. You know, again, just like in the, in the, in the um, uh, what happens when you get the, the, the system here. Uh, like interskin people that get blurred, people here start to move, move, move awkwardly. Go like, you know, they, they start to walk differently than you, you normally do. And that's maybe the reason why we were always shot by police last year. Because you, 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 you look strange. You don't walk like I do it. You don't have this sort of linear way of behaving. You start, you're, you become sort of sensitive in a different way. And that state of mind is, is quite interesting. So she would walk around and not around like, like really weirdly, like if she was on a different planet. Or people would be around her and like photo. See this spectacular building over here of this couple. And no one would notice her. But she would really walk like So that's um, you know, I wouldn't call it ecstatic. I would call it like, you know, like Teresa had this little that she met God or stemple like condition. But it's getting somewhere, you know, in terms of creating a system that will enable us as writers and content makers to, to uh, shape those stories out will matter. But what do you sense inside a suit? And I'm talking to you as designers towards the end of my lecture. Some notes on technology. If you have such a suit, such a complex instrument, 
120 outputs. How will this output make the difference from this output? How will all the body based input ever press here? What should that mean compared to pressing here? You know, legs or head is kind of, you know, getting it obvious or shoulders, whatever. You know, they pull the script like here at all. That's the issue too. Pull the script like that. But, you know, that's an obvious displacement. But what, how, when you get into the high resolution touch things, touching my body, how can I to make that, um, make sense of it? But also how, uh, how do you play it? How do you actually make play it well? Um, we worked a bit on this and we had a really nice presentation at the Height Conference in London here in August uh, dealing with this issue. Because we need body editors. If you want to play your body, you have to edit it. Um, there is no design for the body. There's, there ain't no body editors around. So over the years we have uh, worked on that as well. Here is from the, the um, I think it's the uh, Soviet coagula thing. Here is from the, uh, from the erotic oak piece that shows how I put out all the barriers on the suit. Um, here is other suit. And here is here sort of names and for you know, patterns. What we would do, we would code or number the body with the barriers and manually more or less design patterns one by one. Like this movement would be time based, literally put in the motor numbers and time, and very elaborate procedure. For the blind here, with this one, which is like a DMX, the light table, CO table metaphor, where up here you would have everything over here, like an individual be controlled. You could slide up here, slide here, and turn them up. Uh, you can, or you can set your max peak here. You can select one here, click like 24, click. Or then you could, uh, you could set their key points uh, down here in this window. But again, mechanically, it's very time consuming. Uh, but it's quite advanced. You have a view of the, the bodysuit. And uh, you, you won't recognize it, but for me, this is the front side of the top suit, this is the back side, here are the legs. It's a very you know, reduced symbolical, but it's still a suit image. That enabled me, compared to manual thing, to precisely, more precisely, control the body. But here is what we did uh, recently. So Andreas made this uh, body pattern suit. Uh, you actually touch a very simple iconographic thing. So this was a smartphone. Four patterns. I knew it was here, yeah, why not? So it's taken uh, 10 years to, to get this technology and this thing. And that's you know, one, one kind of intuitive way of doing it. And this dream you know, of touching, using touch with the body, again, you might ask why, what for? Is it art? Is it pleasure? Is it sex? Intimacy? Communication? Um, its purposes are many, but also unclear. How to put the body into this complex. But the dream is old. Uh, the Italian scientist and mystic, uh, Giambattista della Porta, in the uh, 1550s, he would devise this, uh, this body telegram. Uh, and this is again about the cryptography. Uh, he wanted to build a communication system so short no one could, could crack it. So he devised this telegram. And his, his, his approach that time, that was before he had uh, electricity, before he had wires, was to, this is kind of magical, um, he had to discover the magnetism to some kind of sympathy, which was a name for man with the interfaces. You would connect two people or distances. They would both have a magnetic, sympathetic line. They would call a flesh mold on the shoulder. Around this flesh mold, they should place a letter. Same positioning on both bodies. And then, now touch my sympathetic line, touch a letter, 
inside the moment, you would feel it. Thereby building a very personal, intimate, uh, and trackable way of recording messages and communicating. Uh, I would advise you to do this at home. But, um, um, it's, it's an interesting concept in terms of you know, how you deal with secrecy, intimacy, communication, bodies, uh, um, and how you, in a way, strive for deeply personal <coughs> communication. Um, that's where we are right now. Uh, the so-called speeches concept. I've been working on the Insights, uh, intelligent, argument based uh, thing. I know, Rita, I shouldn't talk about this. This is like, you know, Tony, Andreas, and David, who are uh, uh, devices. Um, but it's, it's part of our, our ongoing experimentation here at the uh, uh, A3. How do you build and what is it for the uh, future? Uh, it's not special custom built by me, but it's something you can build yourself. Uh, this one, I can try it afterwards here as a demo. We brought it along, uh, functioning as well. How you can easily build it into or onto your clothing um, and uh, adapt it to your body. Uh, what's new here is that all you need is a smartphone. This is a smartphone. Uh, that's your interface, your controller, uh, it's your communication apparatus. It's your sensor-based device. It's your GPS, GPS uh, um, locator. And it tells you, basically, through Bluetooth, uh, what to do with this one. And this has quite large still have both input and output. But what's unique to them is that they're kind of intelligent. So you can, you know, they're addressable. So if you want to have a one suit output, that's fine. But if you want to have two ones, just add one. Um, it would know by itself where it is. You can just add as many as you would like to. And if you want to have a fourth one here, you just stick it onto the same one. So it's a very adaptable, easy system that you control through a uh, wireless display. And after my speech, I think you can come up and uh, try it. Uh, so you have a really nice interface just to actually play your own body. Uh, and this interface, as you'll soon see, you can just touch the screen, and touch the suit. Um, and this is a um, new method port you're working on uh, towards the future. How do you actually touch not just the suit, but how they touch each, each other in a manner that, you know, whether they're ecstatic or not, comes that sort of play on the body. It enables us to, you know, build a loop between not, not just to my body, but between bodies. Uh, and see how that, how or if it's possible to achieve what Bernini tried to do, to achieve that, that gasp of breath or a wish for life, you might say. The wish to create something alive. I mean, if it's something I still think we have not achieved, it's the how to have a technology that, uh, that brings life into this digital environment for us. Thank you.